Linda McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Going to go through all the topics. And then I have a great interview that you're really going to love that has a lot of juice in it. So let's get right into it. Guys, I just have to talk about Britney's latest post because it's caused a lot of controversy. She did a quote card on her Instagram that said, I found there was only one way to look thin. Hang out with fat people. Rodney Dangerfield, picture quotes. Now, you're like, who the hell is that for the young people? He was a very funny comedian that actually didn't even really make it until he was in his late 50s. He was very self-deprecating, and he was very popular in the 80s, okay? So already it's out of touch of a joke, but, you know, an original joke at the time. Um, I had a friend who had a big, huge black Hummer, and she was single, and I'm like, why do you need such a big car? And she's like, Heather, you don't know how thin I look when I come out of it at the valet. So I get the idea. But she went on to then, under it, say this, which is just not good. Going on, she just repeats a lot of herself, which is the right to do, about the shit that she went through the last 13 years. I wish I could have chosen my nannies for my children. I also wish I could have chosen my dancers. I mean, if I had Christina Aguilera's dancers, I would have looked extremely small. Three dancing ladies. Emoji. I mean, why not talk about it? Mm, Because you're going to see why. Don't you think my confidence would have been a bit better if I could choose where I lived, ate, whom I called on the phone, dated, and who I was on stage with me? It's hard sometimes. Now I see how much of my womanhood was stripped. Okay, so she goes on. Immediately, I wasn't surprised to see this because I'm, I think, you know what? I think she's getting to a place a lot of women do. She's not liking the way she looks right now. Listen, your body changes when you're a teenager, when you go through puberty, when you have kids, when you go after kids. I was probably the thinnest when I was working full time, coming home at 745 at night, putting my kids into a bath, and I would just skip dinner. I was like, oh, my God, I look pretty good. How did I I look better now? It all changes. So I think she wasn't feeling great about herself that day. And then in her mind, well, people are like, what the hell, including Christina Aguilera, was like, what the hell is happening? She unfollows her. She's pissed. And people bring up photos of Christina Aguilera and her dancers. And her dancers were more curvy size dancers. Okay? And I don't. But we don't body shame, girl. This is very unpopular right now. So what she was saying was sort of factual, but so she gets wind of it um, that people aren't pleased with her. And then she does an apology and she didn't even get it. She's like, I'm not calling Christina fat. Like, she's beautiful. She's my friend. Love you, girl. We're like, no, you weren't calling her fat. You're calling her dancers fat. It's not good. Here's the thing. We can talk about Christina I mean, and Brittany. But the the thing is, Brittany is is suffering, and she needs therapy, and she needs to get to a place where um, she has other things going on in her life besides Instagram. That's my opinion. She's gonna step. She doesn't have a publicist. She has no one controlling it, and she still didn't even really get what she should apologize over. So, um, but you know, I just want to say, Brittany, if you ever go on tour, do not be stealing. Lizzo's dancers because they're very happy to go on tour with her. Like most people, sleep is extremely important to me, so I want to thank Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that is making a huge difference in my life and my family's. What I love is this incredible mattress comes to your door in a box, very easy to set up. Peter and I did it. You pop it right. It just inflates like this, and look how beautiful this is. I got the Helix Midnight Luxe mattress, and you can get this cooling upgrade with Galatio Tex, and it's so soft, and it keeps you cool all night long. And Peter and I loved it, but we left for a few days, and Drake took advantage of sleeping in our bed for a while, my oldest son, and now he is going to get one at his apartment at ASU. Obviously, it's very hot there. He's a hot sleeper. Whatever the case is, It doesn't matter because you're going to take a quiz and get the exact perfect mattress for you and your partner, whether you sleep alone, whether you're a back sleeper or side sleeper or a stomach sleeper like me, you take the quiz and they customize the mattress for you. And right now you guys are going to get a great deal because I know you're probably nervous sometimes about ordering something that you maybe 
didn't try. How am I going to try this mattress? What if I don't like it? Well, with Helix Sleep, you get a 100-night sleep trial along with a 10-year warranty, and there's financial options and flexible payment plans. So don't get nervous because if you don't like it, they will give you a free refund. And that's the best part. They'll pick it up just like they did when they delivered it to your door. So simple, so easy. And right now, for my Juicy Scoopers, you will get a great deal. You're going to go right to the link below, click to the link below, and helixsleep.com slash juicy scoop for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress. Plus, you get these two pillows. They're dream pillows, which honestly, they are such a dream. They're so soft. This is my favorite. Oh my gosh. So get on it. Change your life. Change your sleep. Okay, this was so sweet, you guys. Um, I have been obsessed with the TikTok videos of parents showing their young black daughters and some of their sons and even older women. I saw someone show their like grandma and aunt the opening trailer scene to the Little Mermaid, which is the new live action Little Mermaid starling, starring um, Halle Bailey, not Halle Berry, Halle Bailey. And she's a beautiful girl with an incredible voice. And it is so cute. So it's called A Blind Reaction. You can look it up. And little girls are usually familiar with um, with Disney and with this show. So they're kind of like, what is this? And anyway, we were talking about this. And Annie goes, I mean, how do these little girls don't know that, you know, that they've changed it to a black you know, verbate, I'm like, I'm sorry. I guess the four-year-olds weren't listening to Juicy Scoop uh, seven months ago when the news came out, okay? Um, but anyway, it is really sweet, and it really shows people that as especially a little person, you know, people always have a problem with Disney because the stories are about, oh, I don't want my daughter to grow up thinking that she can marry a prince or it's so patriarchal. It's a fairy tale, and if you're a good parent, your child can enjoy fairy tales. And Little Mermaid is a fairy tale about a girl who is half fish, okay? So when there was a big problem with it going from a drawn girl who had red hair to now a live action girl who has who is black, I mean, and people freaked out about it. It was so stupid because I'm like, I love when they remake classic stories. Like, don't break it. If there's a classic story that everyone loves, remake it every 10 years with different characters, um, well, not definitely characters because that wouldn't be a remake, but like you could add a little, maybe a new character, you can modernize it, you can make it fun, and you can make it that the girl or the boy is a different, uh, from a different culture. And I think that's super fun. And then they showed a little white girl and she was just as excited about watching The Little Mermaid. So it's really cute and I'm sure it's making everybody really thrilled. And, um, oh, and then I saw a TikTok about a woman going, but, um, Disney's going to make all this money and are they going to give the money to the black community afterwards? I'm like, what? This is a movie what? and they're providing entertainment, providing you want to buy a ticket or I'm sure you'll be able to stream it a month later on Disney plus. So like why then do like, yeah, the profits go. I, I don't know. I don't understand that. The point is people are excited. It's really fun to watch this reaction. I think uh, she has an absolutely gorgeous voice. I'm excited to see it. Um, there are some people who are naturally born redheads that are marching the streets. And um, so, hey, why not make Beauty and the Beast, remake that one, and make that girl a redhead? I don't know. As a brown-haired, brown-eyed girl who had a sister who was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, yes, all the Disney characters, Cinderella, um, Sleeping Beauty. What was some of the other Snow ones? White. Snow White was black hair. I couldn't relate to her. Also, I was not into like hanging out with seven old men. Okay. So I was never into that story. Um, and the, but I liked Beauty and the Beast because she was brown haired and I liked her yellow dress. But I'm like, I don't want to marry an animal. I don't care how rich you are. I'm not into it. So I was always looking for a princess I could relate to. And I never really could. So I. I might relate to this Little Mermaid, too, because I um, love to swim. So I'm going to probably watch this one and really enjoy it. So it's very cool. Um, 
it's just it's just so cute. Look it up. You'll it'll make you happy. OK, let me get into the Emmys. I watched the Emmys. I didn't expect to watch them. I love that they came on in L.A. early because I that's so that was perfect. Um, and it moved quicker. It felt hipper. It was cool to see all these like movie stars like Reese Witherspoon and stuff because they're all basically on TV now doing these limited series. And so Cheryl Lee Ralph won for Abbott Elementary, which is this show that got a lot of awards and about a public working in a public school, an, under, an underfunded public school. And it's a big hit. It's on ABC. Anyway, she won for Supporting Actress. And when she won, you know, she she appeared to be like she was absolutely shell-shocked. It took her so long to walk up to the stage. And what's nice is they must have known what she was going to do and they knew everyone was going to do because then you could submit your, like, <clears throat> these are the people I want to thank in case I miss it or in case I want to sing a song. So she sang an original song that she wrote about how she's an endangered woman, but she's not going to sing a victim song. And she has a really good voice. And it was like, wow, great. Um, later on, I was watching TikTok and I saw her two actual kids in the audience in the back being like, mommy won. Now, I hope they're their two actual kids and not just kids that want to be adopted by her. But she did mention she had two kids. And this TikTok, I believe, was from their perspective. And they were like, so excited that their mom won. And she thanked her kids and her husband and everybody in her life. And I just want to say, if I win best podcast from a single female comedian host, because I do believe at, in the next five years, there will be an actual kind of a big deal podcast awards. So I'm secreting it and I'm secreting what I'm going to win. And I'm going to come up and sing a, probably an original song, but let's just say I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow since that's what I sang when I was um, doing um, the day at in my sorority where we did a play, which was um, Wizard, Wizard of Oz and I was Dorothy. Anyway, I'm going to warn my sons I will be singing that original song because if I just came out and did that instead of being like, oh, my God, thank you to everyone that listened to my show. I just came out and I was like, somewhere over the rainbow is Juicy Scoop. There's a podcast to listen to that makes you feel like you might want to poop. One day I wish upon a microphone. So if I just came up with that, I would want them to make sure that they were prepared for that embarrassment. Anyway, good for her. She's worked a long time, and she was the first black actress in 35 years to win Best Supporting. And she's been in a lot of shows. She's super talented. Good for her. Mindy Kaling looked gorgeous, and I loved what she said because I didn't even think about this. She came out with B.J. Novak, and their bit was um, we're kind of pissed because when we were doing The Office, we had to do 22 episodes a year for the category of series, okay? Now these series are eight episodes long, Mike White, who did White Lotus, and you can go off to Hawaii in a pandemic and film something with 20 people in your bubble, and everyone can go back and do other movies, and they're not, um, you know, they don't sign a contract for seven years, so, like, you guys have it real easy. And I thought that was so funny, and I really believe, like, Mindy wrote that because she's so funny. But anyway, she looked gorgeous. That was great. Pete Davidson wore a Kanye West outfit and came out in glasses, sunglasses, and was actually kind of funny because he um, was self-deprecating and said really nice things about Keenan, who is was the host of the show and really kept the show moving um, from SNL. This pissed me off. Jimmy Kimmel. So Jimmy Kimmel was in the category of best late night talk show host, along with Jon Stewart and... Um, Trevor Noah, I think, all guys, you know, um, who else? Jimmy Fallon, Steph, Mott, I don't know. They were all nominated. Anyway, he didn't win. Um, John Oliver won. Oh, maybe I guess it wasn't John Stewart. John Oliver won. And because he didn't win, then when he had agreed to uh, do a presenting uh, thing with uh, Will Arnett, he's like, oh, won't the world find this funny? that I've never won and therefore they should feel sorry for me and it's such a travesty. So I'm going to lay on the ground and Will, Will, you pull me like I'm a dead person and I'm going to lay down and I'm not going to participate in what I was contracted to do is read the bit, the nominees for this category. 
I thought it was so rude and so annoying. I'm so sick of Jimmy Kimmel. I'm so sick of him crying on, you know, ever about once a month he cries on his show. I don't know. I don't watch it. He's never going to ask me to be on it, especially after now. So who the fuck cares? Okay, so if this is for best writer of a, I believe, pilot or an episode of our show. Okay, the girl who created the show and wrote it and stars in it, the Abbott Elementary, um, Quinta Bronson, who's beautiful, black, and like the her story is like it took four years. She had an idea. Like this is everything I can relate to, except my pilots never got picked up. But to star in it, to come up with the concept, to write it, she wins. Looking gorgeous comes up there. He's doing his dumb bit. He didn't pop up and be like, congrats, ha ha, and walk away. He laid there. He pulled a freaking Kanye and he laid there. So then she had to go stand there and go, hi, and do her speech. And so rude and so annoying, especially really Jimmy Kimmel. Like, let's just, let's just be woke for a minute. You know, a black female wins for writing and a show that's got like won four other Emmys and is a hit and on your network, ABC, and you, the white male who was handed this show like 10 years ago, who got in trouble for doing blackface, okay, and had to go away and do these, it, that's, like, maybe you didn't know that she was going to win, maybe you thought something someone else was going to win and it would have worked out better, you're an asshole, you should have her on your show, and you should straight up apologize if it's not already in the works, she was really classy about it, she's not being mad, also because she's on ABC, so she's, you know, playing the playing it right, and she's like, it's not a big deal. I'm happy to win. Who cares? And, and also, she's smart. Why, why use her time in answering questions by, like, starting a beef with him? It's not worth it. It's not necessary to the show. She plays a teacher. She's being a classy teacher. So um, hated that moment. Uh, Zendaya won. I lo- Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Don't cancel me. You know I have a problem with names, but you know I loved Euphoria and I watched both seasons. So I believe I can speak on the fact that I'm thrilled that she won. She plays uh, Rue, who is a, a a girl who struggles with pill addiction as a teenager. And her speech was stunning. She's like, if you were, if you are a Rue, if you've loved a Rue, I love hearing your stories. I have chills thinking about it. She looked absolutely stunning. She's an extremely tiny person. Um, and... The dress she chose was absolutely perfect, very like Breakfast at Tiffany's, classic black strapless and uh, beautiful hair. And she just, she looked great. So good for her. Um, Lizzo, too, wore a fabulous dress, big, big, uh, fabulous red dress. And she won her Emmy for her her show, a comp- dance competition show about, what is it called? Watch out for the big girls, about uh, girls that are not size two, that are excellent dancers, and she's picking them to be on tour with her. or they're gonna, And now they're going to go on their own dance tour, these girls. One thing I noticed, though, and we all love Lizzo, but it took a lot of time for her in her big dress. It took up a lot of space to get up there. Then she's calling out to her girls, telling them to come down. Thank God they didn't, because that would have also taken more time. I just noticed for her, the music never played to shuffle her off. You know who the music did play to shuffle her off? Jennifer Coolidge, who's been in this business forever. I knew her from the groundling. She was always so Freaking nice. Talk about another fabulous, supportive person that I know from the Growlings, like Lisa Kudrow. The day I found out I was no longer going to be in the company because they voted, before she knew the results, she called me. I was going to go rollerblading and because I didn't know if I was going to go make it to the main company. And she called me and she's like, you know what, Heather? You're so freaking talented. I don't know. I voted for you. But if you don't go any further, who gives a fuck? You know, people that stay in that theater get weird. It was so encouraging. And I went and rollerbladed. And, like, she's just a great, great person. And she handled her speech great. But she was, the music went and she couldn't say everything she wanted to say. And I'm just saying, I get it. You're the director. You got to save the minutes for the people. And who doesn't love Lizzo? And her dress was great. You know whose dress wasn't great? What is this girl's name? Julia Garner won for Best Supporting. She was also nominated, which would have been amazing if she won for both, but she was also naming for, um, nominated for Inventing Anna in the lead role of a drama, and this was for uh, Ozarks. 
She won. This is an awful dress, okay? It was velvet, which made no sense that then she had a cutout, a diamond cutout on her stomach. Now she has a great stomach. She's pale. I don't mind that. It's a flat, tiny, non-surgical, perfect little belly button. You know when you see those weird belly buttons? Because you know they got like a tummy tuck? No, this is like solid, thin. This girl knew how to do some crunches. I just, it's an awful, awful look. Okay. Um, uh, Gerard Carmichael won for his best uh, stand-up special. And I think it's great he won. Again, not a fan of the outfit. It was about... 90 degrees out that night, and he chose to wear a big white fur. I'm assuming it's faux. I don't know where PETA is. You know, uh, why aren't they angry about this fur? And no shirt, just nips out to the world to see. Also, would have been a problem if he was a girl, but whatever. Nips out, no shirt and a fur. He won. I felt it was very, like, little Nas-ish, like, come on. He's he's gay, and that not that that matters, but... I just felt like, you know, it was like, hey, I'm going to really be me right now, which is great. And congrats on winning. My girl from Hacks won, Jean Smart. She has the best body. I mean, I don't even know how old she is, but this body is so good. And I loved her dress. It was off the shoulder. It was white. It was fitted. It was long sleeve. I didn't love the color on her. I'll say that. If she was my friend, I'd be like, this cut is perfect. But I just think white washed her out a little. Okay. Um, Seth Myers and ugh, Amy Poehler did an awful bit that wasn't funny at all. Sorry, not funny. Um, Connie Britton, you guys, I loved this coral pink color on her. It was like a strapless dress with a cape. And I think she had the cape. Someone said, you know what? You're wearing this beautiful cape that's covering your shoulders. You shouldn't wear your hair down. You should put it back. No, Connie Britton. No and no and no. Connie Britton, for the rest of your career, okay, you need to wear your hair down at these events. Your hair is gorgeous. It makes you, I'm sorry, like, it just, I don't think you look that great with your hair back. Angela Bassett, oh, that body, yellow dress with like a sequence bod bodice, stunning. She looks so good. That's it for the Emmys. There's really nothing more to talk about, um, but it was good. I liked it. I didn't expect to like it. I liked it. The queen is getting, I don't even know where we are in this thing. It's like a lot of days. It's a lot of comments. I said on Tuesday's show that if Meghan Markle was not being well-received, it could be that, you know, people weren't happy with the way she spoke about the monarchy in the last year and a half when she's talked to Oprah and what came from that. I got some hate for that. Really, Heather? You don't think it's because Andrew's a perv? No, I totally think it's because Prince Andrew's a perv and claim that he didn't sweat. I mean, of course I think he's guilty. Of course, you know, I'm grossed out. I just, I guess sometimes I just forgot to say it, you know? And for all those Meghan Markle fans, good. I'm glad you're happy to see her. She looks beautiful. Um, there's TikToks of her being very nice to people. And there's ones where she's like annoyed and like, didn't like the flowers someone handed her. People can nitpick it. There's body language experts. I don't care. She wore the pearls the queen gave her. And I think that's what you do. You wear the jewelry of someone who that the queen gave you. I wear this ring every day. It was my grandmother's and then it was my mother's. So I, like a princess, I definitely think wear the jewels of the people who pass that, that love you. Um, and, you know, it'll be a beautiful ceremony. People are being mean about King Charles, that he has fat sausage fingers. Oh. Also, that he doesn't like the pens that people hand him. So it's going to be a lot of that. Um, like I said, I'm just like, whatever. Um, you know, obviously, she couldn't get her podcast out this week. So I, I don't know what the rest of you guys are doing. Good thing I'm here to pick up the slack. Um, okay, so... Let's move on. Oh, okay. Sister Wives, you guys. Yes, the show is boring and I can't stop watching it. I've told you about this. The first episode is out. They still are talking about COVID and basically Christine breaks up with Cody, who is so awful. And Cody, she's like, I just... I don't want to be around you anymore. You said you never wanted to have sex with me. We probably haven't had sex in 10 years and you don't, and you say the future is 
a not, he goes, a lots of people are in non-romantic uh, marriages and they make it work. I don't know what the hell her problem is. Yeah, but those people don't also have three other wives, one of which who they are boning, which is Robin. And she's like, I, the fact that there's no hope, I'm just not freaking into it anymore. I never liked it. Um, I had to have my own kids watch all the other kids in the day. And then I would go and work at night because I had to bring in an income. And I would ask you, can you come and just put our kids to bed? And you were like, no, I've got other other wives. Well, at that time, they were all living in one big house. Like he could just walk down the hall and put the two kids to sleep that she shared with him. So she started having resentment way back when. And she is out. And he is just a dick. Like people are like, he's such a narcissist. Oh, you think? He has four wives and a TV show and cameramen following around him, him around for the last 12 years. Yeah, he's a narcissist. And he's like, I just don't want you getting some other husband that's going to try to take our money and see my kids. So promise me you won't do that. And she's like, I promise. You got a girl after her named Robin, adopted her kids, made wife number one, divorced you so that she could be the only legally married wife and then adopt her kids, and you're like, yeah, you better not have a guy come around my kids. He is the worst. Can't stop watching it. Bravo Con, you guys, is coming. I'm so happy that you knew to get the tickets to my show. I've got Carlos King, who's got all the juicy scoop, and he is my guest, and I'm going to bring it all, and I'm going to be there right down the street from where BravoCon is at the Palladium, October 15th. If it's not sold, sold out yet, I, I think I'm like down to probably like 50 tickets. I would definitely get those tickets, whether you're going to BravoCon or not, because I'll be recapping all the juice that's happened. And they talk about all the stuff that's going on. There's a lot of things happening on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There's the three days. And, and um, Hollywood Life just posted all the different panels and stuff that you can go to. It's different than it was three years ago. It was definitely more exclusive three years ago. They couldn't sell as many tickets. Now it's like just, you know, I think it's almost like when you go to like a convention, like a Comic-Con really, and you can go to all these different things. So I assume there's going to be a, definitely a couple happening at the same time in which you'll have to choose. But basically it's a lot of putting these panels together. And some people have agreed to do like – six or seven panels. Others, you got to see them that one time because they're a legend. Okay. So there's like, here are some of them. Bravo family night. That's like Candy's family, you know, versus Dolores's family. A lot of family feud type of game stuff is what they're doing with these, these panels. Every housewife franchise will have their own panel with the cast. And then they kind of mix up people. There's a Bravo crew night. There's Bravo to Bravo, which is like all different people. Josh Altman, Golnessa, Shep, Daisy, and they play games. There's uh, Bravo's most golden moment hour, power hour. That's like with the legends, like with Jill Zarin and, and you know, the people that really started it. Um Write the relationship. Those are the biggest flirts. All the single people talk about, like Vicky Golfson, talk about like their horrible relationships and their funny stories. Okay, I assume. Modern love is with everyone's favorite couples. So Amanda, Kyle, Melissa, Joe, Lindsay, and Carl, um, Ariana, and Tom, if they're still together. There's a rumor that Ariana and Tom from Vanderpump are on the rocks. Okay. Um, Jersey boys, all the Jersey house husbands, million dollar listing guys, East Coast versus West Coast, knowledge of Bravo, lots of games and stuff like that. Um, summer house people. Then there's a second legends panel. Then there's the battle of the sexes. So just a lot of ripping off old game shows, but it's fine. We have a lot of fun with it. Um, Bravo, Bravo, fucking Bravo is Bravo, they call they, the way it was described was Bravo super fans like Mercedes, Whitney Rose, and Tamara Judge. They're super fans. Anyway, they get tested on their Bravo knowledge because I guess they love all the other shows, which we know. I guess that's a pretty good idea. Jersey, the Jersey Housewives, Housewife to Housewife, where they like one from each, like one on one or more than one from different houses, from different cities, talk to each other. Bravo BFF, so two Bravo stars that are BFFs play a game against another Bravo BFF. Everything is basically games. So um, if you want the comedy and the juice, you're going to come to my show, The Live Juice Cube, Saturday night. 
which I don't think it conflicts with anything from what I've told from the schedule. So like I said, if you're coming, you should be thrilled. If you haven't, get your tickets now. And um, because after that, I don't know what you're going to do with yourself. Um, Oh, latest on Sherry Papini. Remember her? She was the asshole that faked her own kidnapping so she could hang out with a boyfriend who she claimed she didn't even screw. People said, Heather, they found his DNA on her underwear, but it wasn't like sperm. It could have been like he touched her. He said that she never slept with him. And she just like used this guy to have the world worry about her. Then she showed up and acted like she was shackled, like a Justy, you know, Justy Smollett, right before Thanksgiving, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. By Oh, my God. I heard from so many people that said they met their husband that Wednesday before Thanksgiving in their hometown at the local bar. Now, I don't know what she was planning on doing, but she, went, she came home that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Okay, so then she comes home. Everyone's like, oh, my God, thank God she's found. But people were like, this is so weird. Turns out it was all set up for attention. She's a weirdo. Uh, The husband is divorcing her. And prosecutors are seeking eight months in prison for everything that she put us through. She also has to pay back like the $40,000, $50,000 that she got from like a victim's fund that happens where the state pays you if you're a victim of a crime. So, um, and then also I think there were some GoFundMes and some personal money and stuff that just makes her look like a, like a horrible person. She's, there's a photo of her in court, um, going to court and she looks very thin and definitely not as cute as she used to be. And what an asshole. So we'll see. I think eight months is a very appropriate time. I wonder if anyone remembers what I predicted. I know I predicted something short like this for her time, but I don't know what it was. Um, I think it was, but eight, I think eight months honestly is appropriate. I don't really think she should get more than that. Um, so I hope she gets it, does it, get some therapy while she's in there. Okay, you guys, I'm going to see you this Friday in St. Paul, this Saturday in Chicago with Justin Martindale. And then the following weekend, I'll be in Seattle and Portland with Chris Frangiola. I've got a bunch of weekends, including Vegas, of course, um, East Coast, Texas, You want to get these tickets. This is my fall tour. It is all live Juicy Scoops. All the meet and greets happen immediately after the show. Literally, like, I'll go get a sip of water, come out, and we'll start the meet and greet. That's how it works. And um, the meet and greet tickets are a limited number. So if it's sold out, it's sold out. Please come to the show and get your tickets because the tickets, the shows will sell out as well. And I'm not going to be adding a bunch of second shows. Um, the only second show I added was uh, Dallas, Texas so far. And I don't know that I'll be adding any more. So please get your tickets now. HeatherMcDonald.net. Join the Patreon. Enjoy. And now for a great interview. Um, this is an author of a book called Bully Market. This is for anybody that's ever been in a high stress job, married kids. It really, there's such a life lesson in all of this. And it's a great book, but we had a super juicy interview and even some surprises I did not know were coming that I was like, ah, you came to the right place to share this scoop, girl. Enjoy. So I have a real juicy book and I'm excited to speak to the author about it and get all the scoop. The book is called Bully Market and I'm here with the author, Jamie Fiore Higgins. Welcome to Juicy Scoop. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So um, basically, I think I saw like a a New York Post or something about it and really intrigued me and that you were in the whole Wall Street stock market world, which doesn't have a lot of women in it. And just from seeing what we saw, like in the great movie Wall Street, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, and everything we kind of know about being a, like a man's business, I just wanted you to kind of tell me exactly like what, not exactly, but really just give me the juice. What happened? What is your, you know, advice? What is this book about? All of it. All right. So where should we start? Like, how did you get into such like a a male driven business and did you find it difficult or did you just always excel in math and that kind of the way that the brain works? So funny enough, it's not really what I ever wanted to do. I wanted to be a social worker. 
Um, you know, growing up, I had a lot of health issues and really benefited from my kind doctors and, you know, that kind of support work therapists. So that's really what I wanted to do. And my parents were basically like, no way. She's always said every generation has got to do better. You got to move the family forward. So in 1998, you wanted to make money. You went to Wall Street. And I went to this small liberal arts college called Bryn Mawr and Goldman happened to recruit there. And I went to an event there one night and it was so fancy because it was at the alumni house and there were canapes and cocktails. And there was a super sharp, amazing, gorgeous woman who took the stage and she was so smart, but she was also really kind. And I didn't even know what Goldman Sachs did at the time, but I was enamored with her. And I went home and I called my mom. I'm like, I don't think, I I don't know what Goldman Sachs does, but I really want to work there. And then I did my research and I had 40 interviews to get the job. Wow. It's like, it's like it, it, they really run you through the gauntlet. So I interviewed on campus, then at the local office, which was Philadelphia. And then I had a super day and, you know, I was so happy I got the job because it was just the job everyone wanted. And I was, I was making my family like so proud. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how I got there. And then, you know, early on, I started to really see that maybe the woman I met on campus was one of those like paid spokespeople, you know, that like, wasn't really there because like, I kind of envisioned this Goldman Sachs being this kind of upper crust and, you know, pinky, you know, raised with tea. I don't know. Like it just seemed like this very fancy posh place And I was kind of dropped into this like locker room, you know, with a lot of what I call like the white noise of Wall Street, just comments on women's breast size and leg length and their butt and how good it looks. And, and I was kind of like, where the hell did I go? Because I went to a women's college too. So I kind of, although I didn't rush for a sorority, we were kind of one big sorority. Right, right. So it was very weird going from being where I was with women all the time to being one of the few women in the room. I was like really a prude, like coming into Goldman. I mean, they used to joke, they used to call me Sister Jamie because they would just like make jokes. In fact, there was a woman I worked with a couple years older and she was always off the desk. Like, so we, if you've seen Wolf of Wall Street or Boiler Room, you know, these big, long rows of workstations. And I kept getting calls and I kept filling out the while you were out slips. And um, I said, you know, I hope so and so is okay. And the guys, I go, she's out fucking XYZ at the hotel down the street. How else does she win the business? And I was just like, oh my God. So wait, so she did what you did, but to get, to get clients, she would sleep with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's when like one of the guys is like, don't you know, Jamie, like, you know, sex gets you further on Wall Street than any Ivy League diploma. And so, you know, it it definitely felt like as a woman, we were almost like Barbie dolls that they played with. So I was like, nun Barbie, sister Jamie. And then she was kind of like the slut who slept. And we were all like these archetypes almost um, in this kind of man's world, which was funny because they were all kind of being themselves together, having a great time. Now, knowing about the girl that slept with the people to get the clients, like, are you like, oh, thank God I don't have to do that. Thank God I don't have the morality to put myself in that position. Do, are you like, good for you, girl, use every asset you have? Like, what's your attitude or are you disgusted? You know, I feel like if you were to ask me today, I'd feel a little more like empowerment with it. But back then I w- it, I was just like, ill, just, right? Like I was like, just like, ill. And, and the shame is Heather, she was super smart. Like she, she had everything she needed without that. So it kind of was more frustrating to me that this organization rewarded that or encouraged that. Or is she smart? And she's like, what do I, if, if I got to, you know, think about something for a half hour while I have sex with you and then get your huge account and get to do what I really like doing, investing it. Like I am smart for doing that. Like what, what the hell do I care? Or like oh. knowing, or kind of knowing, like I always say like with the Harvey, all the Harvey Weinstein stuff and everything, I'm always like, where's the woman that comes forward now at like 60 and says, 
yeah, 20, you know, 30 years ago or whatever, I knew the only way I was going to get this great part was to sleep, you know, sleep with the producer. Once the world saw I was a good actress, I never had to sleep with the producers again, but I knew there's no way I'm going to get it just by auditioning. So it's like, I'm kind of like, I always want, I actually really would love to hear from women that actually say that. And they're like, you know, and not that they, yeah. And hopefully today, like, and hopefully you guys don't have to do that today because we've exposed it, but I did have to do it back then, you know? And a hundred percent. And like what I think about my reaction then, like having the years since I've been gone, the process of writing the book and also now thinking about things as a 46 year old woman, not a 22 year old woman. It's like, you know what? She made the decision she made. And to your point, you know what? Maybe in her estimation, this is what she needed to get ahead. Goldman's really good. Like I always say, I started off my career and I was really, really good at numbers and I worked really, really hard. But as I got more senior, I was really good at keeping my mouth shut really good at keeping my mouth shut. So, you know, it started off, um, early on when, um, one of the women who I mentored, you know, and I would be kind of like the poster child of, Oh yeah, you can have it all at Goldman Sachs. And one of the women who, um, who I mentored started having a real hard time with some of the guys who didn't like her and just had it in for her and basically drove all her business away from her, basically called clients and said, She's on our list. Don't do business with her. And then what happened was her volume started going down and therefore her performance started going down. She complained. I tried to support her. She quit. I was happy. She ended up suing or someone sued. I think it was her. And my partner, the senior guy was like, she's saying that these two guys, excuse me, made her life hell. And I said, they did. And then the next thing you know, when she sued, my partner said, Oh, outside counsel is going to call. They want to know from you what it's like to be a working woman at Goldman Sachs. And you're not going to say anything because I'm about to pr- promote you. And then you'll really get paid. So what's negative to say about that? So I didn't say a thing. So like, what's, what's like your attitude now? Because sometimes I'm thinking in the world of like, there is no hazing anymore. Um, you know, there, and there, and sometimes with the hazing back in the sorority and fraternity days, it really does like bond you just like a boot camp. I mean, it does bond you. It does, it does weed out the people that aren't into it. And, but I get in this society, we look around and we're like, that's awful. But at the same time, I mean, maybe those layers are what does make someone a really successful investment banker or stockbroker or whatever. So like what, in like, what do you think about it now looking back um, of how it could be done better or some things that should stay or what? Listen, I think their focus on attention to detail is like super, super important. So I think you could still have the expectations for incredible work ethic and incredible production, but I think you can get that without the shame component. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? I think you could have super high expectations for like nailing different projects, but I don't know if it's necessary to like lock you out of the door that you're like banging on the door, you know, and like shaming people. So I think there's a way that you could still require excellence, but I think at the end of the day, most people are motivated more by attaboys than oh shits. So, you know, I think there's a way that you could still get that kind of best response and best production without the shaming piece. And then I also think the whole shaming piece around your appearance or your interests is like really not necessary. How would they do that? Well, I mean, you know, in my experience, I found that if your values aligned with whoever's in the glass office, which is what you would expect, like kind of a you know, a heterosexual white male, like you're good. But if you have different, you know, if you have different interests, you know, watch out. So for example, I wanted to pump for my kids. You know, I was basically told no, because it's a waste of time though. It's okay. If you leave your desk to get your hair cut or your shoe shined. Right. Right. And then, and then when I actually had the guts with my fourth kid to pump, they mooed at me, put stuffed cows on my desk, 
put milk cartons on my desk. You know, this kind of like stupid little immature crap. And what you know, year was what was year what year was that, that they were doing that? 2016. Wasn't that long ago. I'm just I'm just shocked that like someone wasn't like, hey dude, like what the fuck? Like your wife is home doing this. Why can't she like I just can't believe that I you know, like I always wonder in all this like um sexual harassment stories and stuff. I'm like, you know, the people that we never hear about is the guys that do tell the other guys, like, knock it off, Dick. Was yeah. there anybody like that that was like, you know, because once someone, their, once their peer tells them, like, yeah, hey, you're being a creep. Can you back the fuck away from her? It always seems that seems to really work the best. And so I always say, hey, if you're a guy listening to this and you see it happening, be that guy for your female coworker before it gets to a place of HR and someone having to quit or whatever. Did, did you experience any of that? So not enough. I'm not going to say there were none, but what I found is, and you know, I feel like in some ways I joke that Goldman put the cult in culture. There's this like unwavering, um, um, loyalty toward like this senior person. So, you know, they might think it, but they're afraid to say it because so for example, this guy I used to work with, who was a partner at the firm, like, one guy was demoted because he wanted to leave early to get to coach his kids little league team. You know, like these things were just like honestly talked about. So I think there was so much fear to stand up that even if in your gut, you're like, this doesn't feel right. They're like, you know what? I don't want to shoot my mouth off and have my bonus slash too. So it's that kind of like group think mentality where that one person has the power to create the environment or one or two people have the power to create the environment. So that's one of the things like I want to spread the message with this book. And I've gotten like 200 different messages from people, a lot of women, but a lot of men who are like, you know what? I don't look up enough and pay attention. I'm just so focused on my own world and, and my own stuff that I don't look up enough around and say, Hey, cut that out. And I'm going to start doing that more. Yeah. That's good. Do you think though, in this post me too world that, um, cause I've heard this, especially in the finance world that women were getting hired more and we were seeing more women in this field. And then with the me too, it's too risky for the boss because he's like, I've already got, you know, 20 guys. And if I hire this pretty girl, that's, that's, you know, got a lot going for her and the, grades and everything. If I choose her over this guy, I can't trust that they're going to go out for drinks after in a big group and someone's going to get drunk and say something wrong or possibly, you know, hit on her. I'd rather just hire all guys. Do you think Mm. that's starting to happen? Listen, I think that, yes, I do think that's happening. And in fact, too, like, I know that's happening with women who are like nearing childbearing age. Like I had a guy who told me offline, like I was looking for someone and I just want to avoid anyone in their twenties or thirties. Cause I don't want the headache of a maternity leave, which is just like crazy to me because it's like men can father kids in perpetuity right. until they're like dying day. And it's never thought of as like an affliction, you know? And, um, so yeah, listen, I think a lot of the big corporations are saying we want to hire 50% women. And the good thing is that they're doing it. The problem is they're not sticking around, but I really think that the sentiments are changing. And I think it has a lot to do with the experience your parents had, meaning I don't know about you, but my parents were the, like, you suck it up. You stay for 40 years, you get the gold watch, you know, I feel like a lot of these younger kids, they have parents who kind of worked through the 2008 crisis and maybe don't have that loyalty that you suck it up. It's maybe you look for the best environment for you and make it work. And so I think companies have to be really thoughtful about number one, what they're expecting from their employees off the clock. And if those expectations are in line with everyone. So you could have a fair where, where women and men can have a fair, you know, way to both succeed where it's not slated all the way for one side to succeed and the other side, not. I mean, do you feel 
like I know I feel um, as a working mom that um, I oftentimes have a lot of sadness about what I missed when they were little. You know, I said my biggest regret is that I didn't I didn't fight my husband more on putting this and purchasing a, a play set in our backyard mm. because I could have used that, you know, after work with my kids. I could mm. have gone and had my coffee out there with them and stuff. And I'm I have so much more time now that I have my own business than, but I did have the commute. I could not, I never, I never ever used the mom card. And I was the only mom on staff. And then as the men started having children, they did leave for doctor's appointments. They were going to the doctor's appointments. And I was like, wait, where is he? Oh, you know, little Timmy has a, his six month checkup. And so he went with his wife and I'm like, are you kidding? Like I've been here for seven years. I started when my kids were four and one and a half and seven, my stepdaughter was seven. And I'm like, I, my husband took them, you know? And then on my, in my office, they would often really make fun of the fact that my husband was the main caregiver. And I was like, so you, it would be better that he was working full time. And we just had a nanny that didn't give a shit about our kids raising them. Would you, would that, would you prefer that? Yet all these other men, their wives were home all the time. And I'm like, I will never diss your wife for being at home with your kids. And so it's like, I just think so many times it just has to be pointed out like you did with that, with that story about the, which was biologically impossible for a woman to go off to Asia. Like once you bring it up, then people are like, oh my God, you're right. That is so wrong. You're totally right. You know, it's like, it's just pointing it out so much more that I think is so like, you know, it's, it's just very important. And I think in, in going forward and like finding um, the careers that work for you, I also think the other thing that I've noticed is really interesting. And maybe it's my for you page on TikTok. I don't know. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of like young women that their flex is that they married well and they don't have to work. Mm. And they do that. There's a whole trend where they're like, yeah, look at this. And, you know, I, I can just go to Starbucks and wear Lululemons and and I can have as many kids as I want because that's what he says. And, and people, and it's kind of weird. Cause like when I was growing up, you know, my mom was so happy to go to college herself. And she was so happy to work after being a stay at home mom for 17 years that I just assumed I would always work. But there was this little part of me that was like, well, that would be nice if I didn't have to. And now I think people are realizing like, it's, it, you don't like you should be able to if you can that that's not like a shameful thing even if you have an education or whatever like i mean i do think it's hard to get back in the workforce that's the only thing i do mm. think that is hard if you go like 10 20 years without ever having some type of job and i also think for your own self esteem um i think each parent man and woman should always have at least something outside of the home that gives them confidence, whatever that might be, a big or small of a career or a charity or whatever. I think that's really important because I think if you might get too comfortable and if you get divorced, I don't care how rich you thought or how good, great you thought the deal was, it could be pretty crushing. Like, like if you get divorced and you're a stay at home mom and all you did was raise your kids and at seven, you know, your last kid's 17 and the husband's like, yeah, I'm not, we're not in love anymore and I'm leaving. Mm. And you don't have a job to go to and you don't have a career and you don't have anything. And now all the kids are out of the house. I think that could be extremely devastating. And that's why I don't think it's a, it's a, that's why I say you should always have something else going on just for your own like confidence because the kids leave, they leave. Yeah. I mean, listen, I would say that I think it's, oh, I think when I think of women's empowerment, it's like having the power to choose what's best for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not necessarily if you have that college degree, put it to good use with the job. If that's not the choice you make, what I would say is like part of the problem I had was I had my identity was so tied up to being a managing director at Goldman Sachs, which kind of to your point, someone's identity could be so tied up in being someone's trophy wife. Or Or being someone's mom. And to me, it's a super slippery slope Mm -hmm. when your identification is tied to one thing. When I left Goldman Sachs, Heather, I was depressed. Like, 
so depressed. Like it was as if my identity at Goldman Sachs was like the anchor, like, like the balloon weight to my balloon. And now I was just floating in the, like never sphere. Like, who am I? What do I do? So I think that as people, as humans, we have to have an identity that's our own, regardless of what we do for money or what we do for a career. And guess what? Some careers don't pay. Right. Yeah. Your career might be to be someone's mom or someone's home and they don't pay, but you have to be more than that. Because right. to your point, the job might end. The man might leave. The kids might go to school. What then? Right. And yeah. like, to me, writing this book has been such a discovery of like, I am beyond what I do. I am who I just am. It's like not yeah. just what we do. It's just who we are. You know, I, what's also interesting is that um, I was talking to someone and her parents were older and they lived in this really nice, like retirement, Sun City community thing. And they were like very outgoing people in their seventies. And they're like, oh my God, we're so busy every night. You know, we're p- part of all these clubs. And the mom goes, you know, what's so amazing is no one asks, what did you do? They just say, what do you like? What so are you like, binge watching on Netflix? Yeah. They're what like, book what did you read? What you- podcast do you listen to? Yeah. And I'm like, well, why do you have to wait till 70 to have start a conversation like that? Like everybody in our age range, you know, it's always like, oh, and what do you do? What do you do for a career? What's your I, job? And it's like, yeah, that, and now, and not then when you're 75, no one's asking, oh, so you were a doctor. I don't really care. Are you joining the swinger, you know, yeah. the swinging club over here or whatever? Totally. You I know, ask like, people now, what do you watch? What are you binge watching? What are you reading? Cause yeah. I don't care because I refuse to believe that that's how we're defined. Right. And, you know, for me, like when I walked away from that and, you know, it's part of the reason why I did is because I, one of the big reasons why I walked away from Goldman Sachs is I cheated on my husband while I was at Goldman. Well, let's get to that. Yeah. I want to hear about that. Tell me about that. Let's end on that juicy bit. Yeah. Yeah. So like, and you know, you'll appreciate. How long were you married for when this happened? Um, Probably, ironically, seven years. So, and you had how many kids at that time? Three. Okay. And so how did this affair start? And so, you know, kind of going back to the guilt, I mean, I wanted to be everything to everyone. I wanted to be that mom. I was, I was, I was like zipping out, dialing into Girl Scout meetings. So, you know, for my girls and I was trying to be, well, probably not even at that point, but I would say PTO meetings to be a class mom, right? Yeah. I was trying to be everything to everyone and I just couldn't do it. I just felt like I was failing at everything. And I worked with this guy for years. He had just sent his youngest off to college split kind of, we talked about often happens and it was my, and you know, you'll appreciate this. And I feel like a lot of people, the young people don't, but it was my Calgon take me away moment. So yeah, for, yeah. Your, for your young listeners, they won't get that, but it was like my escape. And so here I was, I was strung out and here comes this guy who'd be like, let me take you out for a glass of wine. You know, you're doing everything right. You're such a good mom. You're such a good employee. Like, let me just take it out and like, just tell you how great you are. And I just melted. Because I just and felt- so what? How many times did you go out for the glass of wine to the point where you got the tingles, and then it led to more? And that's the funny thing because I had worked with this guy before this, and I hadn't gotten the tingle. So it just goes to show you a lot of times when this stuff happens, it's just more. It's a fix. Like it could have right. been cocaine, right? It was just a fix. Right. It's so like it, circumstantial. Sometimes. Totally, totally. Yeah. And I had three kids under three. Ugh. And I was just, my husband was miserable because he took a step back from work to help with the kids and we never had time to talk. And so it was glasses of wine every Friday. And then it was, let me take you out to dinner. And then it, it, and then it was, you know, oh my gosh, like fooling around in a dark bar and wait. So when, when did the first kiss happen though? The first kiss happened in the back of a town car. Like in the back of like a Cadillac Escalade on the way okay. home after a dinner. And it was just like, he made me feel so beautiful, so wanted. I felt like a woman again. 
you know, not just a mom and a breadwinner and a daughter and, you know, um, and you know, my husband and I, it, we hardly talked and he was miserable and it, it felt so good. And then of course I had so much shame afterwards. Cause I'm like, what the hell am I doing with my life? But he also knew I was ripe for the picking too. And he was lonely and he was always, so now would you like go to hotel rooms and stuff like in the middle of the day? No, because he, he was an empty nester. So, and that's how I actually got caught <laughs> because he, we would go to his house and then my husband <laughs> saw my activity on easy pass and he would like track my phone and he'd be like, I know where you were. And, you know, and really the biggest moment was that we were at the point where we were hardly talking. And then my daughter called one night when I was like, literally like we were like naked there. And my little daughter was like, mommy, my belly hurts. When are you coming home? Like, I want you to snuggle me to bed. Oh. And I was just like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Like, this is just like, it was my kind of come to Jesus moment. And then, you know what I really realized, Heather, was that like, you know, this sounds so bad, but it's just true. Like, I realized my husband could pick up off and leave me. Like, here I was, like, I was making all these bad decisions. I had a really unhealthy habit of taking Xanax, like Tic Tac, Tic Tacs. So, mm-hmm. you know, drinking at night fooling around with this guy. And then, you know, and my husband was like, if you don't call it off with him, I'm out of here. So now how do you find out? Okay. Oh, the easy pass. So when did you end tracking my phone? Okay. So 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 wait, first the daughter called, but he didn't know about it. And that made you feel bad. And then you found out about it. And, And then I came home and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. It was a late night. And he's like, I know where you were. I was tracking your phone. I see your easy pass. I know you were around. And I was, I was in New Jersey, but did he think that you were sleeping with someone at that point? Or did he just thought you were like blowing off the family? I think he thought I was more blowing off the family and like, kind of to your point, like, why the hell do you want to come home to this hot mess with the three kids under three? Like, you know, and plus, and, and in my defense, I did go out with clients a lot. Right. Right. So then when did you admit it or stop it or what? Yeah. Well, right then and there, he was like, I will leave you. And Heather, I'm embarrassed to say that, like, I didn't even think that was an option, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, like, I could just lose it all. Like, I could lose it all. Like, and again, I can't tell you enough. This, thinking back to our original conversation about the girl who was fooling around with the guy in the middle of the day at lunch, like, I remember just being so shocked by that. And here I was messing around with my boss. Like, what a cliche I had been, you know? And what I, what I really realized was it was just my escape. Like I was in such a pressure cooker there, basically constantly looking the other way when I witnessed bad things happening, you know, telling lies to protect my job. And then, you know, now doing this, I was like, what did I become? Like, I was like, sister Jamie, I was the good Catholic girl, you know, like, so, so that night you guys, you admit it all to him that night. Yeah. And then, um, I, I mean, all of it, he like put his fist through the wall. My husband oh. is like, my husband is like such a nice guy, but like literally he had had enough and he was doing bad stuff too. He was drinking way too much. He was partying with his friends, doing God knows what God knows who he stopped wearing his wedding ring. And I'm like, here I am working my butt off to make this money for this family for what? And the fun- family could, could, yeah, to, and the family could be destroyed. Yeah. You know? And like, you know, I talk a lot about my grandmother in the book, but like my Italian grandmother, you know, with the St. Jude candles and working the beads, the rosary beads for me, you know, she had been long gone, but I was like, what would she have thought of me? You know? Yeah. Like she didn't raise me to be like this. Um, and so, so then, then did you go ahead? Yeah. So yeah. So then I called it off with him and, you know, ironically it was such a mess, but I had gotten promoted and The way it works at Goldman is they have these titles. Basically, everyone eventually becomes a vice president. That's not like a super exclusive title. And then there's managing directors and partners. And they really manage the number of those to keep it exclusive. And so basically, I had been promoted. He had been asked to leave. I didn't realize it at the time. But basically, right when I called it off, he basically resigned. 
because so it all worked out nicely. It all worked out that he wasn't there. And when um, you, how did you tell him that it was over? And did he try to convince you otherwise to do otherwise? Yeah, he could be, he, and listen, I don't really know what his real intentions were at the end of the day, but he gave me the best lines that, you know, well, he me. wanted to take care of me and, you know, he, he, he loved my kids and he wouldn't mind stepping in and imagine we'd have these amazing weekends together in the city and we'd go look at art galleries and he was kind of selling me this like amazing thing where I, you know, only have my kids every other week and I would get to play in the city and kind of going back to, I was kind of the arm candy, right? Like yeah. here I was in my late thirties. He was in his late fifties. Like I was his like young, you know, romantic interest. And uh, yeah, he, he told me he loved me. He said all the right things. I don't know if he meant them. I, I don't know. No, wait, how did you tell him? I told him it was over and I pulled him in the office. And then that's when he told me he was leaving, that his days were numbered there. And so, um, it was kind of this like crazy moment, but then honestly I was happy yeah, because he was like, like the, the temptation was gone, you know? Right. Um, and then did you ever, did you guys go to counseling? Did yeah, you ever see him did. again? I never saw him again. And it was the best thing that ever happened to my marriage, Heather. It was the best thing. Like, because you know what? I've been married 18 years now. So this happened maybe around the time I was married, 10 years, that kind of thing, eight years, nine years, 10 years. And you know what? If people are married long enough, they either go through some major crap. Agree. Yeah. They're super lucky and they don't, or they're lying about it. Mm -hmm. And the major crap doesn't have to be a fair. It could be issues with substances. It could be issues with money. It could be lying, you know? Some sort of, and so to me, I always say to my husband, I'm like, we like basically knocked down the building back to its studs and rebuilt it. But now I'm so good because, and he is such a gem, my husband, because he realized it wasn't about him. It was about, my affair was a coping mechanism. It was a, it could have been drugs. It could have been alcohol. I mean, I was also taking drugs and alcohol, but you know, in right. the, the day it was just one other thing I was trying to do to kind of cope with this unbelievable pressure to perform, to make money constantly with that carrot dangled in your face to just do what you need to do. Constantly making decisions that were completely against who I was and who I wanted to be. And it just took its toll. And so, um, so then when did you officially leave? So I ended up leaving a couple years later because, you know, as I said in my book, I I couldn't quit it cold Turkey. Like I couldn't quit the money just like that. Like I really felt I needed, you know, Goldman really does a number on you. They made me feel like I was nothing without them. You know, in fact, one year, right after bonuses were paid and we all made all this oodles of money, my partner handed out bananas to all of us, literal bananas. Just say that you're like a little working monkey or what? You're all monkeys in my book. Ew. And, and, and every day the bar gets higher and every day you're earning your seat. And if you don't earn your seat, someone else is, there's a line out the door looking to take your spot. So I really felt, Heather, that I was nothing without them. I really walked out. Even the day I walked out, I felt like, wow, I'll never make any money again. I'll never be successful again. Because they really made me... Now, looking back, I'm like, you know what? Sure. Did Goldman Sachs get me access to clients? Sure. But I was good at what I did because of who I was. Because I was smart and I worked my butt off. And I was you know, thoughtful and engaging. And I was great with clients. Um... So it took me a couple of years. And then unfortunately I, I ended up, ironically, that guy left and the guy who replaced me was a real difficult one. And, um, he actually, um, was a really bad actor and the kind of end result was, you know, I told you all those years I looked the other way. Yeah. Got this new boss after the guy had an affair with left and we were out at a client event in public. And he used a racial epithet on a person of color outside. And I don't know, Heather, if I had already kind of started to return to who I was, right? I was making amends with my husband. And I think, you know, I always felt like at Goldman, 
we were kind of this dysfunctional family, but all the dirty laundry was inside. And now it was out in public. And I said, that's it. And I called employee relations all those years where I never said something, you know, I mean, there's so many things we didn't cover, but I was assaulted. I didn't say something, you know, the woman sued. I didn't say something constantly harassed proposition. Didn't say something. And now I said, that's it. I'm saying something now. And I went to employee relations and they promised me anonymity. So I told, told them what happened because finally, you know, seeing it out in public, I was like, this is bad. And the next day, my partner calls me in my office and stupid Jamie thinking he wants to talk about my latest profitability report. And he said, I got a call that you complained against. You made a complaint against Justin. He's like, you know, we're a family here. You've just gone against my family. I've taken care of you like you're my daughter and you've gone against my family. And I don't appreciate that. And from that point on, Heather, my reviews went down. My compensation went down and they made my life hell. That's when the mooing happened. That's when all that stuff happened. And for me, it was like, I've got to get out of here. So at that point, I'm like, let's put a date on it. I ended up getting pregnant and I left. But with you know, baby number, wait, with baby number with baby five, baby number four, baby number four. Oh, so four. I had three. And then they made my life miserable. I actually had a really bad miscarriage. And I say bad, like um, a lot of like traumatically, physically. I mean, miscarriages are always traumatic emotionally. Right. Yeah. But this one was resulted in a lot of, you know, blood loss. It was like mm-hmm. a spontaneous abortion. Uh, they, I think that's what they call them. And they just made my life miserable. And I left. And you know what? I am so better off without their money. And without their kind of Jedi mind effing that they do. Um, well, I mean, I'm ex- I have not read your book and I'm definitely going to read it. I'm very excited for our listeners to uh, get it because it sounds juicy. There's a lot, obviously, we didn't cover in this. And just as a, a, just as a female pursuing a career, I think there's going to be a lot of life lessons in there. So where, where can everyone get the book? So it's anywhere where books are sold, you know, Amazon, your local bookstore, the big bookstores like Barnes and Noble, you know, did you, way- do an, did you do an audio? I did. I actually narrate it myself, which is funny because right. I have this raspy nasally Jersey voice, but I cut, I, I, I made the cut and I did it. I felt really strongly that if I had the guts to tell my story, I should have the guts to say it. Um, yeah. Great. So That's yeah. Awesome. I think, you know, in some ways it's almost like a cautionary tale. And I really want, I really want people to not have to sacrifice who they are for what they do. Cause that's what I did. And I think we all deserve it. Men, women, anyone deserve better than that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. The book is bull bully market, bully market. And, um, I'll, you know, we'll share all all of it in the, in the show notes and stuff too, but it was great talking to you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you being interested in my story and sharing it with your listeners. Absolutely.